in the last couple of lectures, we've been talking about external mass transport towards a, a catalyst particle or towards spherical catalyst particles where you only have external diffusion. So two lectures ago, we talked about a single particle. And then in our previous lecture, we talked then about how that might be implemented in a pack bed reactor. So what we're gonna do today is solve two example problems where we're gonna try to understand now how some of these variables that we've been discussing in class actually influence the performance of, of pack bed reactors. And so we're gonna start here where we have an irreversible decomposition where A goes to B plus C inside of a 10 centimeter diameter, 10 meter long pack bed reactor. The bed has dense spherical catalyst pellets that are one centimeter in diameter, resulting in a porosity of 45%. Pure A is fed to the reactor at a pressure of 10 atmospheres and 400 degrees C at 10 liters per second. And under these conditions, it's known that this process is mass transport limited. And so we're asked then to plot the conversion as a function of the reactor length, if we know the diffusivity and we know the kinematic viscosity. And then we're asked to, then to find some variables that, that could be changed to increase the conversion. Okay. So in our previous lecture, we derived our a version of the rate law, which was DFA DV equaled AC times RA double prime, where RA double prime, of course, was the aerial reaction rate. And then we did a couple of transformations, knowing that when we have this external diffusion limitation, that velocity is also going to matter. And so we ended up transforming this in that last lecture to dCA times U, which we called the, which was the velocity, dL was equal to AC times RA double prime. And we know from two lectures ago that RA double prime is equal to KR times KC times CA over KR plus KC where of course KR is the kinetic reaction rate constant and KC is the mass transfer coefficient. And when, when the reaction here is mass transport limited, we also did another simplification and mass transport limited really just means that KC is much less than KR. And when you take that into consideration, then the denominator simplifies significantly here. It basically just becomes equal to KR and this simplifies to simply be Kc times Ca. And so we can make this substitution into our expression here, dCa times U, dL is equal to Kc or minus Kc times Ac times the concentration of A. Now where this differs from our discussion in the previous lecture was that in that lecture, the change in the number of moles was equal to zero, right? We had in that lecture, just A goes to B. But in this case, that's not true, right? We have A goes to B plus C. And so we know now that the change in the number of moles is equal to one. And that means that our velocity is not gonna be equal to our initial velocity, right? And so we have to figure out a way to take some of this into consideration. Now, recall that we've derived an expression already that relates the volumetric flow rate. And here we have a cylinder with a constant cross-sectional area. So those are, are essentially equivalent. And so we know that the volumetric flow rate is equal to our initial volumetric flow rate times one plus epsilon times X times P zero over P times T over T zero, right? And in this example that we're going to solve here, we're gonna simplify things a little bit and we're gonna say that this is happening isobarically and this is happening isothermally. And this will significantly simplify what it is that we do because remember in our expression for the mass transfer coefficient, we also have 
things like the diffusivity and density, and all these are functions of temperature. So things can uh, snowball where there are a lot of things that are a function of temperature and, and the problem becomes fairly complicated. So we'll simplify that here and we'll operate at constant temperature and pressure, at, at least here. And we know then that the volumetric flow rate then is just V0 times one plus epsilon X. And last time we defined that the volumetric flow rate, or at least we said the volumetric flow rate could be expressed by the linear velocity times the cross-sectional area. So this just means that our velocity times the cross-sectional area equals the initial velocity times the initial cross-sectional area times one plus epsilon X. And of course, the cross-sectional area in our cylindrical reactor is gonna be equal to a constant. And we're left with the velocity equals U zero times one plus epsilon X. And this is gonna help us, right? Because it changes inside of that derivative. Well, we also know just from our mole balances that we've done before that CA is equal to CA zero times one minus X over one plus epsilon X, and then times the ratio of the temperatures and pressures. But of course, we already said that those were equal to a constant. And so now inside of the differential over here on this side, we can substitute these two things. And so we get that D times or D of CA zero times one minus X over one plus epsilon X times U zero, one plus epsilon X DL is equal to minus KC times AC times CA. We'll just leave that for a second. I'm sorry, I got a little cram there. Now on the left-hand side of this equation, right, the one plus epsilon X will cancel. And we're left with this constant CA zero, and we're, we're left with U zero, and then the differential of one minus X. So this just becomes equal to uh, U zero times CA zero times D one minus X DL, and that's equal to minus KC times AC times CA, which of course we already have is CA zero times one minus X over one plus epsilon X. And we can even do another simplification, right? Where the CA zeros are going to cancel. And the differential here just becomes minus DX. So we get minus U zero DX DL equals minus KC times AC times one minus X over one plus epsilon X. And of course those negative signs both cancel, right? So those just go away. And, or I could have said it differently where you just divide by U zero and you end up with DX DL equals KC AC over the initial velocity times one minus X over one plus epsilon X. And in this problem, we could calculate the value of epsilon. So we know that epsilon is equal to the mole fraction of A times the change in the number of moles over the absolute value of the stoichiometry of A. So that's just one times one over one, right? So that's equal to one. And we end up with this expression here that DX DL equals KC times AC over U zero times one minus X over one plus X. We'll kind of box this in and put this off to the side for a second. Now, when we're solving a problem like this, we need to now find AC, KC, and U zero. A couple of lectures ago, we talked about one method to find KC around a single particle. One of the things here that you have to consider is that in a pack bed reactor where we have multiple particles, uh, we have to find a different expression. Uh, one that takes certain things like the porosity into consideration. So we're gonna pick on KC first, but 
one of the things I want to discuss here about KC is that there are many correlations that can be used to calculate KC. We talked about one, like I said, for a single particle a couple of lectures ago. And all of these correlations are empirical, that people took dimensionless parameters, they plotted them against each other, they found linear relationships, and uh, we use those within uh, the ranges that they're valid. So if you were looking to solve for KC, there are several that you could choose from. In, in this particular problem, I just happen to know that we can use uh, something called the thones kramers correlation, which is on page 700 in your book. And that correlation says that the Sherwood number is simply equal to 1.0 times a modified, and it's actually a modified Sherwood number, is equal to one times a modified Reynolds number, that's what these primes are, to the one half times the Schmidt number to the one third. And they're modified because they want to take into consideration the bed porosity inside of the pack bed reactor. And so this SH prime is actually equal to something that looks very similar from what we did in class previously over DAB, right? This is the part that looks similar. But now it's multiplied by the porosity over one minus the porosity times one over gamma. And gamma is a shape factor. And it is trying to take into consideration really the effective um, sphere volume of a bunch of different types of shapes. Um, so it's equal to the external surface area divided by pi times the diameter, the effective diameter of a particle squared. So for a sphere, for example, it's equal to one, right? Because the surface area is just pi times the diameter um, squared, right? So for a sphere, gamma equals one, right? So we're going to use this shape factor later on when we talk about non-spherical particles. But in this problem, the shape factor is equal to one. The other modified dimensionless variable here is the Reynolds number. And so that here is the velocity times the diameter of the particle times the density divided by the viscosity times one minus the porosity times the shape factor. Okay. And so we're going to use these. Uh, from the thones kramers correlation now to try to find an expression for, uh, for Kc as a function of other variables, okay? And let's go ahead and insert these into this equation. And when we do that, right, we find that Kc times the diameter of the particle over the diffusivity times theta over one minus theta times one over the shape factor is equal to our velocity times the diameter of the particle times the density divided by the viscosity times one minus the porosity times our shape factor again, right? That's raised to the one half times viscosity over density times the diffusivity, right? This is the Schmidt number raised to the one third. And if we do this, we can then solve for Kc, okay? And if we do that, Kc is equal to, I'm gonna pull out this velocity to the one half because it's something that we're actually really interested in. So we have the velocity to the one half, then times all of these other things. So the diameter of the particle 
times the density over the viscosity times one minus theta. And I'll also just take into consideration here that the shape factor is equal to one. Right, that's raised to the one half, then times our viscosity over the density times the diffusivity to the one third, then times all the other stuff that was here. So that's gonna be multiplied by uh, DAB over the diameter of the particle times one minus the porosity over the porosity, okay? So that's how we're gonna calculate KC. But the velocity is gonna change, right? We already said that over the length of the reactor. So what I like to do in this situation is I don't wanna carry all of that stuff because it's all constant in the problem, right? The particle diameter is constant, the density is gonna be constant, um, the diffusivity is gonna be constant. In fact, we know that the viscosity over the density is the kinematic viscosity. So that's what we're gonna end up using here in a minute. And so I just like to call this whole thing here that I have um, underlined, just KC prime. It, it makes it very easy for me as I solve the problem later to just find this, which is gonna be a constant and only carry one term around, which is the velocity. So we're just gonna say then that KC is equal to this thing KC prime times the velocity to the one half, okay? Now we know what this velocity is. We already have an expression for it, right? It's times or the product of the initial velocity times one plus epsilon X. And of course, epsilon was one raised to the one half. And that is going to modify our equation a little bit, right? Above here, we had dx dl was equal to kc ac over u0 times one minus x over one plus epsilon x. And of course, like I said a moment ago, epsilon is equal to one. So when we do this now, so dx dl is going to be equal to ac times kc prime over the initial velocity times the initial velocity times one plus x to the one half times one minus x over one plus x. And we can simplify this a little bit, right? Because the u zeros are both there. The one plus x's are also here. And we have dx dl is equal to ac times kc prime over the square root of the initial velocity times one minus x over then one plus x also to the one half, okay? And the nice thing about this is that everything you see in this circled region is a constant. And so now we can go about the business of calculating those constants, okay? So since we were picking on KC prime a second ago, and we had a very long functional form for that, let's, let's solve for that first, okay? So we have this expression up here at the top of the screen for KC prime. So let's use the fact that the kinematic viscosity is equal to um, the viscosity over the density because we're given the kinematic viscosity in the problem and solve for KC prime that way. So KC prime, you know, given above is simply equal to then the diameter of our particle over uh, the kinematic viscosity times one minus theta to the one half times the kinematic viscosity over the diffusivity. Sorry, to the one third, not the two thirds. Then times DAB over the diameter of the particle times one minus theta over theta. Okay. And like I said before, 
everything in this equation is constant. Uh, from the problem statement, we know the diameter of the particle. Just to sort of revisit that. We know that our particles are one centimeter in diameter. Right? That's there. We also know the diffusivity is 1.7 times 10 to the minus three centimeters squared per second. And we also know that the kinem kinematic viscosity is one centimeter squared per second. Uh, we also know uh, that the porosity is of the bed is 45%. And so you'll see, right, those are all of the variables that are in this equation. So since that's the case, let's plug all of those in. We can find that Kc prime in this problem is 0 0.182. And the units here, if you go through uh, each one of these, becomes centimeter to the one half over minutes to the one half, which I know are sort of weird units. Okay, so we have Kc prime. So the only other two things that we have to calculate are our AC, which was our uh, which was related to the geometry of our packed bed reactor from the last lecture and then the initial velocity. So let's do AC first, right? And we derived an expression for that uh, at the end of the last lecture. So that's sort of bonus content in the, in, in the video from lecture 22. And that's six times one minus the porosity divided by the diameter of the particle. And in this problem, right, that's one minus 0 0.45 divided by one centimeter. And so our value for AC here is just 3.3 .3 centimeters to the minus one. And then we can also get the initial velocity. And we know that that's equal to the initial volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So we're given in the problem that the initial volumetric flow rate is 600 liters per minute. And we're given the diameter of the tube in centimeters. So it probably is a good idea for us to convert the units. And that's something in a problem like this, of course, that you really need to be careful of, uh, especially in a calculation like KC prime, where there's so many different things that are going on there. So we're going to convert this from liters to, uh, to cubic centimeters. And so there are a thousand cubic centimeters in a liter. And we're going to divide that by the cross-sectional area, which of course is just pi times our diameter, which was 10 centimeters divided by two squared, right? Pi r squared. And that is 7,640 centimeters per minute for our initial velocity. And so we can get a value then for all of that at the, at the front of this problem uh, if we wanted to make our lives a little easier. So AC times KC prime over the initial velocity, um, that just equals 6.87 times 10 to the minus three centimeters to the minus one. So our problem simplifies here to just dx dl is equal to this coefficient, right? 6.87 times 10 to the minus three centimeters to the minus one times one minus x over one plus x to the one half. Okay. And the units here actually make sense. And it's one of the reasons why I took this product, even though it seemed a little bit unnatural maybe for us to do that. Conversion is dimensionless. Length has the units of one over, or of centimeters, right? So the left-hand side here is one over centimeters. And so we can see that the right-hand side has the same units, which is good. It's a good check for us to have. Okay, so we have this problem. How do we want to solve the problem? The way that I did it was I just use Euler's method, our good friend that we've used a lot over the course of this class and implemented it in Excel. So 
here is my Excel file that I use. We're going to actually come back to this in just a second. Um, but here's the result where we've plotted what was asked, right? The conversion as a function of the reactor length. And, you know, depending on the target conversion, right, we would be able to design our reactor based on this plot. I also made a point here to plot the velocity versus the reactor length. And the reason I did that is because in the math that we did, all the one plus epsilon x on the left-hand side of the equation inside the differential all canceled. But I want to make the point that the gas velocity is still changing. And it should end up at about twice the value or exactly twice the value at a conversion equal to one because we go from one mole of gas to two moles of gas. And that's exactly what we see here, right? We start at about 1.25 meters per second. We end up at about 2.5 meters per second. Okay, so we've been able to answer this problem by applying the math that we've done up until this point. We found a correlation to find the mass transfer coefficient and, and we were able to find that. And knowing that the velocity changed, we actually pulled the velocity out of that, um, out, of the, out of the correlation. So hopefully that part of what we did makes some kind of sense. The other part of this problem, though, was trying to ask what are some of the variables that could be changed to increase the conversion. So in a problem like this, I'm going to open this up to you guys. What do you think that we should change to try to manipulate the conversion? Like the residence time? There you go, the residence time. And if we can't modify the volume, how else do we manipulate the residence time? The volumetric flow rate the volumetric flow rate. So if we were to change the volumetric flow rate in a problem like this, the interesting thing here is that it doesn't have the same linear effect that it would have previously because in, a, in just a plug flow reactor or under kinetic control, even in a packed bed reactor, changing the volumetric flow rate only modifies the residence time. And so if you go to lower residence times, you go to higher conversions, right? Because you allow the reactant to be in the reactor longer. In a case like this though, where your external mass transport controlled, when you change the volumetric flow rate, you also change the velocity, right? So if you were to reduce the volumetric flow rate to increase the residence time, you also lower, um, you also uh, lower the velocity. So let's say that we change this from the flow rate that we had, right? To something like 500 liters per um, minute, right? And hold on, let's see if I can actually do this in a way that you guys can see the difference. So that's where we started. And then we went to about 80% of the value and that's how the curve changes. There's not a lot of difference, right? Now you could do something really extreme. You could, you could significantly reduce the volumetric flow rate. And you know, let's say that we could go to something like, uh, sorry guys, that we could go to something like one. So, okay, fine. That has a really significant effect. But we would never do that because the production rate would be much, much lower, which is not a good thing. So, you know, when we're thinking about these problems, you know, the difference between 500 and 600 or 600 and 800 is not really that significant. And so there's not a lot you could do around the volumetric flow rate. Sometimes you could maybe change it by a couple of percent and then you can maybe um, manipulate the conversion that way. In this case, if you're going to redesign the reactor, what is another variable that would control the, the mass transfer coefficient? So we said that one way to do that was with the velocity. What was the other way that you could control the mass transfer coefficient when we talked about this a couple of lectures ago? It was the particle diameter? Yeah, it was the particle diameter. So let's say that we chose a catalyst 
that instead of a particle diameter of one centimeter was, I mean, even uh, let's say 0.75 centimeters. So that increased the conversion at a given reactor length, right? If we had, then we could even have halved that value and have had a huge effect, right? So that's where, that's where we started. That's if we have the particle diameter. So in this case, when you're mass transport limited and you know that um, you know, your, your external diffusion limited to the catalyst surface, what should we do? Well, decreasing the particle diameter simply does, well, it does two things. One, it gives you more surface to work with. And the second thing that it does, as we talked about a couple of lectures ago, is it decreases the diffusion layer thickness. And so you increase the mass transfer coefficient, Kc. Now you'll notice when I changed the particle diameter, it didn't change Kc prime. Those were all, um, or I guess it does change it a little bit. Um, it didn't change U0. So it doesn't, um, it might not be immediately obvious how significantly we changed, um, how significantly we changed the mass transfer coefficient, but it's, it's pretty significant. And even Kc to the one half um, about doubles, okay? And actually it should be the square root of two, if I remember correctly, if we look at the, if we look at the functional form, okay? So we were able here, I think, to solve our first real problem where we're taking, we're really taking the properties of the catalyst particles and the porosity of the pack bed reactor and that sort of stuff into, into account. And we'll be doing that, you know, obviously a couple more times um, until we get to the end of the semester. So now I want to solve a problem that's actually, the solution is very short, but it, it's something to maybe drive you guys to think a little bit. So the second example is that an intern is asked to take data to determine the kinetic information for a chemical reaction. And it's taking place inside of a stirred reactor. And they come back with the following data set. And here you have four different concentrations and four different stir speeds where you know, the, the stir speed in RPM is the left-hand column, and then, uh, and then the concentration increases from one molar to two and a half molar as you move to the right at each one of these speeds. So how can we use this data to find the reaction order and KR? So we have a problem here where we're actually manipulating the mass transport, right? We're changing the stir speed. How do then we extract kinetic information from a data set where we know we're manipulating mass transport? And the key to the answering that is understanding when you look at this data set, where is the data set controlled by mass transport and where is it controlled by kinetics? So, what does stirring do in this problem? Why is the stirring important? So what happens as you increase the stirring inside of the reactor? I'm sure it would increase the velocity of the fluid. Exactly, it increases the velocity around the particle. So when you increase the stirring rate, you're increasing the mass transfer coefficient, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we know from what we've been doing lately that the rate of the reaction at the surface is equal to Kr times Kc times the concentration of A over Kr plus Kc, right? So what would happen to Kc if we, as we stirred faster and faster and faster, it would get what? Bigger, right? We just said it would get bigger. And at some point, you would stir so fast that Kc would be much greater than Kr. And when that's the case, right, minus Ra double prime would just equal Kr times the concentration of A. And so if we were ever to see that in our experiment, 
what it would look like is that the mass transfer doesn't matter anymore. And if you look at the data set that we're given here, that these last two rows are very, very, very similar, right? That the data looks exactly the same, right? There are very small differences between 1600 and 2500 RPMs. So one of the things that we might then be able to say is that once we get to 25 RPMs, we're no longer mass transport limited. We are limited by our kinetics. And if that's the case, then this becomes quite frankly, a very easy problem for us to solve. In fact, we've done this before, um, but it was masked when we were using experimental data to find reaction order and to find, um, and to find the, the rate constant. So if we build from that, where minus R A double prime is equal to K R times C A raised to some reaction order. Well, let's take the natural log. And so the natural log of minus the rate is then just equal to the natural log of K R plus the reaction order times the natural log of C A. And so, if we know here that we're kinetically limited, let's just plot something very, very simple, right? We're gonna plot the natural log of the reaction rate versus the natural log of the concentration of A. And if we do this, right, our slope is the reaction order and the reaction rate constant is the intercept of this plot. Right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint file here where we have the reaction rate in millimoles per second right in these boxes. And then we're given the initial concentration. Right. And so we'll just do that um, for one case. Right. Because all the cases, uh, especially these two, we know are uh, have mass transport effects because as we increase the rotation rate, right, the values are changing. However, as we, so we don't actually know here if you're mass transport limited or not necessarily, but you certainly know here you're not at 2,500. So let's plot the natural log of these concentration values versus of those concentration values versus the natural log of these rates. And if we do that, we get a perfectly straight line. And as I said, right, the slope is the reaction order. And that slope is almost exactly two. So we know the reaction order then is two. And the intercept was equal to minus 2.948. And if you take, um, right, the KR is the, uh, or the intercept, I apologize, is the natural log of K. So KR is just the exponent of the intercept. And so then we find that the reaction rate constant is 0 0.052 inverse second. 